At last, the assembled theologians had framed their learned judgment of the writings before them. Twenty-four assertions had been called and condemned as heretical. But no sooner was sentence of condemnation solemnly pronounced than the synod was shaken by a mighty earthquake. Picking themselves up from the floor, theologian, friar, and bishop, in terror, cried out that God was expressing his disfavor with their censure and vindicating the truth of the doctrines under consideration. But with stunning presence of mind, and bold audacity, the primate, Courtenay of Canterbury, who had acted as principal prosecutor and foremost fugleman in the hearing, declared, no, the earth's shaking is no judgment of God upon us. Rather, it is the land breaking wind of the foul heresies we have here condemned. Compose yourselves, for the earth bears us favorable omen. When the news of the earthquake synod, as it was ever after known, reached John Wycliffe, he concurred in his interpretation with the first instincts of the unseated theologians, God's geologic gainsay. And perhaps this was only natural, for the heresies had been called from the works of his pen. Now, some may consider the inclusion of John Wycliffe Oxford scholar of the 14th century, um, among our profiles of Reformation protagonists, somewhat puzzling. Uh, didn't the Reformation transpire in the 16th century? The sharp observer may ask. True, yet Wycliffe can credibly claim consideration among the ranks of the reformers as he ant anticipated and even faithfully articulated certain of the truths the Reformation would trumpet. Fox, the martyrologist, <coughs> employs a fine and well-deserved metaphor in dubbing Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation, that bright light upon the horizon, boding of the day about to break. Well, at the very least, he is certainly a notable fiery object still dark sky. And Wycliffe's link to the Reformation is not simply by parallel pronouncement of distinctive doctrines, but materially through a succession of uh, disciples who spanned the intervening century. Research has shown that the regions in England most responsive to the Reformation preaching were precisely those where had been uh, where uh, uh, there had been a concentration of lawlers. Those were Wycliffe's followers. Were known as lawlers. Why were they called lawlers? Lawlers. We don't know. There's a lot of dispute about that, and we just don't know. You know. Uh, further, uh, maybe because they were just lawling about all the time. No, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Could have been that. Could have been that. <clears throat> further. Uh, certain of his Oxford students, who imbibed his teachings, carried them home to their native land of Bohemia, where they took hardy root, particularly in the mind of one Jan Hus, whom Luther would later read and declare, he is one of us. Indeed, in Prague, there is preserved a manuscript which depicts this very trio, Wycliffe striking a spark, Huss kindling the coals, and Luther brandishing the flaming torch. And so the evangelical doctor, is, as Wycliffe is called, is fit for inclusion in our Reformation gallery of portraits. <clears throat> as to the where and when of his birth, we are quite in the dark. Scarcely any two of his biographers agree on the date or place. 1330 is probably as good a guess as any and better than most. And several villages have been suggested as bearing the honor of his birthplace, uh, even one that never existed, such is the fecundity of scholarship. <laughs> uh, a Yorkshireman, at any rate, and uh, from a family of sufficient good means and name as to generate expectation for a career as an ecclesiast. But not even the powers of imagination of a mother's ambition for her son 
could have conceived of the contours of Wycliffe's career. It started out, normally enough, proceeding to Oxford to, uh, for his studies. Uh, the inordinate amount of time it took him to complete his uh, studies, 16 years, by no means indicates a remedial mind, for Wycliffe was among the most brilliant and versatile scholars of the century. More probably, it related to the inconvenience of his undergraduate years at Oxford coinciding with the scourge of the bubonic plague, the dreaded black death, and the attendant difficulty of finding any surviving dons to deliver a discourse. It's a huge incommodity when the entire faculty is killed off by the black death. Uh, this prolonged educational affair was financed by his drawing a salary for being the parson for a parish where he wasn't. Uh, this typical arrangement in those days was not frowned upon if you procured some substitute to cover for your years-long absence. Uh, Wycliffe, it appeared, had uh, gained sufficiently notable reputation at Oxford for sharp wit and trenchant debate that he was drafted into the services of the king to serve in his diplomatic corps, engaging in hammering out controversies with the Pope. Now, the papacy at the time operated very much as a secular uh, power and thought this eminently appropriate, uh, seeing as though Peter had granted them two swords, as you recall, one for spiritual, the other for secular authority, as the uh, theory went, at least in that day. This double arsenal came in exceedingly handy for spiritual threats, then, could be brought to bear for political clout and economic advantage. As, for example, when aluminum was discovered under the Vatican, and they began to uh, mine that, and then uh, they uh, proclaimed, uh, the spiritual papal edict, that everyone must acquire their aluminum from the Vatican or else uh, they would suffer damnation, uh, thus securing an economic monopoly. Yeah, so that's how this is. Or, or one of my favorites, uh, when their enemies hired the Genoese crossbowmen uh, to, uh, these were some really high caliber mercenaries in the day, they hired Genoese crossbowmen uh, to uh, try to challenge papal expansion. So the Pope just conveniently declared that, quote, anyone who uses a crossbow will fly like a bolt to hell. So uh, this is how you can combine you know, your, your, your spiritual authority for economic and political advantage. And the papacy had been particularly successful in their spiritual threats in England. Uh, the ultimate weapon they could wield was the ban or interdict, uh, whereby all the sacraments that the church offered would be suspended, completely suspended, all across the land. So, imagine, seven sacraments. No marrying, no burying, no baptism, no mass, until compliance was rendered by the rebel monarch. Uh, this mechanism had been invoked under King John, you remember bad King John, the days of Robin Hood and Richard the Lionheart and so forth, uh, till he conceded that England was the feudal fiefdom of the Pope, with a payment of a thousand pounds annually, as feudal do. Uh, that was a lot of money in that day. Such exercise of secular power and authority, Wycliffe thought a complete usurpation. The church, he argued, was called to exercise spiritual not civil dominion, Rome had completely mistaken its mandate. Wycliffe thought it scandalous the way the papacy understood its power of binding and loosing, which it was so quick to invoke in defense of its power politics. <clears throat> Wycliffe preached against such perversion, impelled, he surmised, by sheer avarice on the part of the papacy, in terms not likely to be misunderstood, styling the Pope as the Antichrist and <clears throat> the proud worldly, as the proud worldly priest of Rome. And uh, most, the most cursed of 
uh, clippers and cut purses, in other words, thieves. Well, such flagrant assault could not be suffered by the occupant of the fisherman's chair without rebuke. A bull, a papal pronouncement, was issued against Wycliffe, who, as the bull pronounced, quote, hath gone to such a pitch of detestable folly that he feareth not to teach and publicly preach, or rather to vomit out of the filthy dungeon of his breast certain erroneous and false propositions and conclusions, savoring even of heretical pravity, and worst of all, tending to overthrow our status. Wherefore, being unwilling to connive at so deadly a pest, we strictly charge that by our authority you seize the said John. But for all the Pope's mighty fulminations, the Oxford scholar had many a sympathizer, and some in high places. At Oxford, the masters of theology pronounced that the 19 propositions that the papal bull had condemned were in fact true, though they, quote, sounded badly to the ear. Uh, attempting to be politic, Oxford forbade Wycliffe to maintain those theses of lectures and sermons, lest scandal result. Uh, Wycliffe observed that to condemn a truth, uh, quote, because it sounds bad to sinners and fools, would be to make all scripture liable to condemnation. Uh, well, and even at Lambeth, the archbishop's uh, palace, where the accused uh, was being cited for heresy, those four Wycliffe were as many as those who opposed him. And the palace became the site of not a courtroom, as intended, but rather of a violent brawl. Literally, fisticuffs broke out as they were, uh, with Wycliffe being carried away to safety by his friends. Well, Wycliffe's enemies, uh, momentarily stymied, had no intention of letting him escape their wrath. But the very next year, 1378, a 40-year controversy broke out between rival claimants to the papal throne, the Great Schism, it was called, each hurling their anathemas at the other and excommunicating all who followed him. As one has described the spectacle, two popes, each with doubtful title, made all Europe ring with their mutual invectives and anathemas. Rome cried out against the corruptions of Avignon, that was the rival papal seat, and Avignon, with equal justice, recriminated on Rome. The plain Christian person brought up in the belief <clears throat> that it was a sacred duty to be in communion with the head of the church were unable to discover amidst conflicting testimonies and conflicting arguments to which of the two worthless priests who were cursing and reviling each other, the headship of the church rightly belonged. Well, <clears throat> this exigency, and at one time there were three popes. They actually appointed a third pope to dissolve, but the other two didn't withdraw, so you actually had three in the ring duking it out. Uh, <clears throat> this exigency uh, proved too dramatic a distraction for the cloven papacy, and they ceased to bother about the Oxford scholar, and Wycliffe was able to write away in peace, <clears throat> and he was quite the pamphleteer. Irony and invective, of which he was the master, he did not hesitate to use, and he wrote not only in Latin, but in English, bringing his passionate conviction within the comprehension of the common folk, who usually shared his direct idiom. Uh, just as Luther would be the most vigorous tract writer that Germany has produced. So Wycliffe is considered the foremost religious pamphleteer of his, uh, well, that's ever arisen in England. Really quite remarkable. For a taste of uh, Wycliffe's uh, rather uh, low blow uh, anti-clericalism, -clerical here is his acronym for cardinal. Here's his acronym of cardinal. Cardinal, what means cardinal? Well, look at the acronym. See, captain of the apostles of the realm of the devil, impudent and nefarious ally of Lucifer. Cardinal, that's what it stood for. There you go.
Wycliffe has certainly mastered this genre, the, the father figure, figure for this brand of alehouse anti-clericalism. But uh, by no means were his works simply criticisms of various Roman abuses. Uh, Wycliffe had a mind capable of higher flight than this. After all, he was the most distinguished theologian of his generation at Oxford. His, his ready pen also promulgated doctrinal truths unknown or at least long forgotten in the church of his day. In uh, 1378, the year the schism broke out, he produced his Truth of Holy Scripture. In it, over the space of a thousand pages, Wycliffe asserts as lucidly and passionately as would any of the coming reformers, the supreme authority, sufficiency, and perspicuity of the scriptures. Uh, one historian reckons that more was said about the Bible as the divinely appointed guidebook for the church in this single work of Wycliffe's than in the sum of all other medieval theologians combined. For Wycliffe, the scripture was the final authority, not pope or priest, council or custom, county friar or church father. He writes, scripture is the rule by which heresy can be distinguished from its opposite. Once the writings of other great teachers, however true, are called apocryphal and are not to be believed except insofar as they are founded upon the scriptures of the Lord. Or again, there is no court beside the court of heaven. We should admit of no conclusion not approved there. Though there were an hundred popes and all the friars in the world were turned into cardinals, yet should we learn more from the gospel than we would from all of that multitude. But uh, was this not preaching to the choir? You think, surely people believe this in Christian medieval Europe. Well, no, for most of his contemporaries, theologians included, most, did not make a distinction between scripture, tradition, and the laws of the church. One of the top scholars in this field calls Wycliffe's demand that scripture be the exclusive measuring rod, a, quote, radical innovation. Uh, ecclesiastical authorities may not only not contradict scripture, but neither may they add to it. All they may do is interpret it. Neither should they presume a monopoly on its correct interpretation, said Wickham. And he backed up his beef with backbone. He wrote a commentary on the entire Bible a line-by-line -line commentary, the Postula Super Totum Biblion. In his age, Wycliffe had an unrivaled knowledge of the biblical text. Well, not only uh, was scripture to be the sole authority, but Wycliffe affirmed another truth which diverged radically with contemporary conviction. Wycliffe affirmed that scripture was comprehensible even to the simple who approached it with a humble and hungry heart. This was the Reformation doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture. Not, in its claim, its claim is not that everything it affirmed was simple to grasp, but that its main message was clear enough. The gospel is accessible to a reader. As Wycliffe wrote, Christian men and women, old and young, should study fast in the New Testament. And no simple man of wit, intelligence, no simple man of wit should be afeared unmeasurably to study in the text of Holy Writ. The New Testament is open to understanding of simple men as to the points that be most needful to salvation. A perspicuity scripture where you can get the main message of salvation. Or again, no man is so rude a scholar, unlearned, uh, no rude a scholar, 
but that he may learn the words of the gospel according to his simplicity. But though the Bible might be an open book as to its life-giving message, simple folk had in Wycliffe's day no book to open. And Wycliffe answered his own eloquent call, setting himself to render the scriptures into the vernacular, for none such English translation existed in that day. In this ambition, uh, Wycliffe set himself plumb contrary to the determination of the Roman Church, which was intent upon keeping the Bible the exclusive preserve of the priesthood. Indeed, the Council of Toulouse, to live is Toulouse, no, in, 50, er, in 1229, uh, had positively forbidden the use of the Bible to any layman. And the uh, ferocious persecution of any and all those who dared disobey this prohibition. Think, for example, of the Waldensians. Fierce persecution against the Waldensians attests to the vehemency of their conviction. Nevertheless, Wycliffe, eager that every cottage dweller in the realm might read the Bible in their own tongue, gave himself to the task. And happily for the project, Wycliffe had quite a number of helpers in his posse of Oxford students and disciples who tried their hand at translation under Wycliffe's supervision. So now Wycliffe knew no Hebrew and probably no Greek. So he worked from the Latin Vulgate. This would have distinguished him from Tyndale, the later translator. Okay, so this is strictly from the Latin Vulgate. So whatever inaccuracies this entailed, the result of Wycliffe's labors was a priceless heirloom for the English people to pass on to their children and children's children in its gospel phrases. It's likely that uh, many of these phrases became the common property of English homes, as certain of these, uh, which for those of us who are familiar with the King James language will recognize. Phrases like moat and beam, or the straight gate, these things. These, these, these go all the way back to Wycliffe. We don't have everything because most of it's been, been burned, but um, uh, he had a, a good way with language. But for all the plowmen and peasants, who clutched their pages as their most prized possession. There were others who execrated the work and sought to expunge it from the land. The Archbishop, Arundel, at Wycliffe's death, denounced him as, quote, that pestilent wretch of damnable memory, yea, the forerunner and disciple of Antichrist, who, as the complement of all his wickedness, invented a new translation of the scriptures into his mother tongue. Think of that. Huh? <laughs> Indeed, the Roman church ruled, 1414, that the reading of the English scriptures was forbidden upon pain of forfeiture of land, cattle, life, and goods from their heirs forever. In other words, if we catch you reading the Bible in English, we will not only kill you, but we will take away all that you have, and not only from you, but from all your descendants forever. <laughs> That's playing hardball. And as subsequent history would prove, it was not an empty threat. Rather, one they would grimly fulfill on many an Englishman willing to risk his life that he might read the word of God. The sad fate of one man named Scrivener attests to their extirpating zeal, caught with just a shard, a page of the Gospel of John in English. Uh, he was burned alive for his offense, and his captors forced his own little children to light the fire that consumed him. Well, as well as exalting the role of scripture for the church, Wycliffe also downgraded that of the papacy. In his mind, this was correlative. At 
The very time he wrote, Europe was confronted, as mentioned by that spectacle, uh, scarcely credibility generating, of rival popes, Clement VII and Urban VI, hurling uh, anathemas and their damnations at each other and their followers, while promising heaven to those who would render them obeisance. Uh, Urban VI had promised plenary indulgence, a complete indulgence for a year to all those who would join his army and march against the rival pope. Uh, in short, uh, the time was ripe for a re-examination of the role of the papacy. And Wycliffe answered this need of the hour with his Power of the Papacy. This is a 1379 work of his, in which he argued that the office of the papacy uh, was instituted not by God, but by man. Further, that the Pope's authority was confined to the church and did not extend to secular government. And more importantly, that the Pope's authority was not automatic, rather depended upon his having moral character. Now, such a statement was synonymous to a wholesale rejection of all the Pope's in recent memory. And neither would there ever be a split decision in the matter. Uh, it was not as if the incumbents in the fisherman's chair succumbed to an odd vice. Rather, they led in the van. Um, I'm going to turn the next page to illustrate that. It is just not fit for any company, let alone mixed. Uh, well, while the denunciations from Wycliffe's pen sound extreme, uh, the reality was extreme. In his uh, latter years, Wycliffe would denounce the papacy as antichrist, calling the pope the head vicar of the fiend, the revelation of the man of sin. So this is piquant and provocative propositions here, uh, yet where Wycliffe shocked his contempor contemporaries most was in his rejection of transubstantiation. The Romish uh, dogma that at the invocation of the Mass, the bread and the wine ceased to be bread and wine and are changed into the body and blood of Christ, uh, actually, physically. Um, in one uh, sermon, Wycliffe mentions how many an innkeeper would not let a priest enter their wine cellars for fear that somebody might sneeze and he might give a blessing. Uh, and then suddenly all their wine would become blood, and they'd be, they'd be out of stock. Uh, these were some of the, uh, the, the, the common notions. Uh, well, Wycliffe asserted that the bread and wine remained just that, uh, bread and wine. Christ was present, he affirmed, uh, but as a soul is present in a body. His precise meaning is unclear. Uh, Reform, Lutherans, different people try to just say, well, yeah, that's kind of what we say. It, it, it's, it, it's not all that clear, but um, in any case, uh, for assertions such as these on scripture, Pope, and Eucharist, the 24 propositions were called that were condemned in that synod of 1382 that was so dramatically punctuated by earthquake so boldly interpreted by Archbishop Courtenay as the land-breaking wind of Wycliffe's foul heresies. Well, Wycliffe still enjoyed a good bit of support. That very year of the earthquake synod, uh, one remarked, that sect has so multiplied, has multiplied so widely that on the road, every second person you meet will be a disciple of Wycliffe. But Courtenay and his party were gaining strength. And the court had now given up support. The royal court had given up its patronage of Wycliffe. At Oxford, diligent search for Wycliffe's writings was, was made, and the bonfire of books uh, burned them to ashes. Uh, Wycliffe himself it was inhibited from preaching, and he retired to his rural rectory at Lutterworth, where he was confined. Uh, his last act that we see on record as he leaves Oxford was uh, hawking or pawning his copy of the papal decretals, get a little money for something useful. Uh, well, he was now old and suffered a stroke, uh, but this, far from rendering him inactive, seemed to push his pen with even greater urgency. 
before, conscious that his days were numbered, and at the same time, conscious of his teeming brain, he worked with feverish haste before the night should fall. And the night fell while in church, December 28, 1384, when Wycliffe suffered a second stroke and died, as the chronicler writes, having lit a fire which shall never be put out. Another observer marveled that one so pursued by so many enemies could ever have died in his bed. Admirable, he writes, that a hare so often hunted with so many packs of dogs should die quietly. But his disciples were not granted this boon. They were hounded to death or driven underground, remaining dormant till would come a brighter day for the gospel over a hundred years later. Finding no welcome in his native home, the afterlife of Wycliffe's labor was to be worked out in a land far from England. Some of Wycliffe's pupils at Oxford had come from Bohemia and took with them upon their return some of their tutor's writings that they had rescued from the flames. Indeed, more of Wycliffe's writings are preserved in Bohemia, modern day Czech, uh, Czech Republic, than are preserved in England. They had done so much to burn them there. Uh, and there, in distant Bohemia, some of the very truths which had seemed to perish with Wycliffe were given a new voice. As to the Oxford scholar, when his enemies gained their day, they proceeded to Lutterworth and dug up his body and burned it. An empty victory. An empty victory. As one chronicler commented, they burnt his bones to ashes and cast them in to the swift, a neighboring brook running hard by. This brook conveyed his ashes to the Avon, and the Avon into the Severn, and the Severn into the narrow seas, and they into the main ocean. And so the ashes of Wycliffe are symbolic of his doctrine, which is now spread throughout the whole world. <laughs> One of the students. Oh, you want to stop that and start again? No. <laughs>